Hey guys, thanks for joining us again for another episode of the Detour Podcast. I'm Dan Jones, joined as always by John Ify Trevorrow. We don't need to do backgrounds for John. If you don't know who he is by now, then you haven't been listening to the show. Uh, <laughs> we want to kick things off, obviously, by sending our thoughts and condolences to everyone connected with Richard Moore. We had him on the show uh, for World Championship Preview uh, last year uh, through Jamie and Bernard's connection at the Flandrian Hotel. Absolute legend of uh, cycling, obviously former writer, um, journalist, podcaster, uh, and from everyone that you talk to, just one of the nicest blokes in cycling. And it was a real shock given that he was only 49 years old. And, uh, you know, if it's just rocked the entire cycling community, mate. Yeah, I just got a text from uh, Phil Liggett because no one was really saying what actually happened, but it seems he just passed away in his sleep. He was over covering Wilbur Gimmon and uh, the next night he's just... Uh, yeah, pass away in sleep. And as you say, Dan, an absolute uh, uh, sensational guy, one of the great voices uh, of cycling. He had a, he's from Edinburgh. He had a very, uh, uh, a really, really uh, great accent to listen to. He just was uh, a great podcaster. Started that cycling podcast, one of the one of the first big cycling podcasts, which we're all doing now. We're all jumping on his on his uh, um, coattails, but. Really nice guy, right? Com Games, I think in ninety, I think down Kuala Lumpur, I think. Oh yeah, um, yeah. yeah, and um, yeah. So I said it was a good bike rider. Written some fantastic books, um, and you know, yeah, just a, a, a genuine guy in the game. It's forty nine. It's just too much of that going on right at the moment. Mm. Anyway. As we said, yeah, thoughts to everyone connected. Um, we've got a yeah. big show tonight. We've obviously got the Tour of Flanders on the weekend, but uh, we thought, why not bring back a couple of hitters, a couple of great blokes, and a couple of blokes that, uh, you know, they're, they're forever going to be connected to that famous Tour de France in 2013, and that is, of course, Daryl Impey and Simon Gerrans. Great to have you back, fellas. <laughs> it's great to see you. And if... It feels like the Blues Brothers bringing the old band back together. <laughs> All right, I don't know. I just feel good now. I just feel good. <laughs> now, we'll start off with you, Daryl. You're you're a YouTube bloody sensation, mate. Uh, well, you've got I've your you've a storm at the moment. You have. You it's, have. Um, I think I've hit about two thousand subscribers now. So I've like hit that milestone, you know, that place where you really like start to notch up the the views and stuff. But um, no idea of your quality, Dan. And uh, ah, hey, hang on, mate. Hey, that. Talk yourself down, mate. You've got little icons that flash up. You know, the subscribe now. You've got little arrows me. coming. That's not me, mate. That's that's Who, who's doing that. Oh, uh, sure, oh. mate. I'm not doing any. Oh. Of that. Oh. I told you, I'm talented, but I'm not that talented. You know? <laughs> one, thing you're, one thing you're always good at, Daryl, is delegating. Exactly. Yeah, yeah you know hey, your strength. What about delegating, that guy? That guy is just saying I'm a delegator, yeah. Right. You're on me, Daryl. You delegate to a to a, a Dan Jones lookalike. You know, that's what I do. Exactly. Yeah. He's actually <laughs> he's actually exactly like Jonesy. So it's so easy to to work with him, actually. It's so simple. But yeah, I mean That's scary. There's two of them. Jeez. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> no, I've been I've been really enjoying them, Daryl. You you're quite creative and you're getting a lot of good content out of your fellow writers, and that's the key, isn't it? Yeah, like, you know, that's challenging, actually, because, like, I went to UAE and we had, like, more time there and it was more, like, fun. So then, like, uh, like I could get more out of the guys. But really, like, when you start coming to, like, the bigger race, like, Terreno and then Catalonia and then guys are talking about winning the GC and uh, all these things, then you kind of, like, I don't want to be that guy putting that camera in everyone's face. And I'm supposed to be also, you know, trying to go for the win myself. So I don't want to be seen as a class clown and guy who does videos. But uh, it's been, yeah, it's been quite, it's been quite, it's been quite hard to read the room. I kind of get where you come from, you know, like oh, you, it was you were in the game and you were kind of like, gee, I don't know how to approach the guy now. But I'm not trying to approach anyone. I'm just trying to get like a bit of the good stuff, really, you know, like yeah. some of the funny stuff we do. But it's, yeah, I mean, I, I've actually been quite enjoying it, really. Like it's, uh, you know, there was a bit of a moment there this season where I was a bit like, oh, it's a bit flat, and then just to started to start doing these things, and then. Uh, I thought, you know what, if it takes off, it takes off. If it doesn't, I'll just have memories of the last couple of years of my career and that'll be cool. <laughs> well, talking about media, Gary, you, you've obviously been doing the commentary uh, for a number of years now and uh, you're teaming up with the SBS crew this year, commentating on a few races. You're going to be doing Flanders this weekend? Yeah, calling Flanders this weekend. Um, yeah, that's right, James. I've been doing a few races of commentary here or there. 
um, it's by far, a, you know, it's a, it's a long way off a full-time gig, but I enjoy sort of stepping back in and, and calling the races with whoever the lead commentator is at that time. So I've done a couple of uh, races with FBS, which is pretty convenient being here in Melbourne now because the studio that we call from is, is just down the road. Um, so, yeah, it can wave him last weekend, Flanders this coming weekend. Good stuff. Now, you? you've, you've just got back from uh, a little stint over in Europe because you've still got your your, your uh, um, other little uh, business over there. So just tell us about your uh, impressions of the last couple of weeks over in Europe with you know how frenetic it is, Simon. Yeah, I've had a couple of trips to Europe already this year. I had two weeks there in February um, and then another two weeks in March. And it's busy again. Europe feels like it's back to its bustling self. Um, pretty much all my flights were close to capacity. Airports were busy. For us, you know, with the service course, business is really picking back up again. So people are travelling to ride their bikes um, and that sort of thing. And I think, you know, Daryl vouched for it as well, that Girona is, um, seems to be back to, to where it was. So the whole, whole world in Europe is just getting back, to, getting back to normal, really. So the cafes are pumping, Daryl. I don't go to cafes, mate. I don't have time for cafes. Between running my YouTube channel, oh, yeah. training bikes, I've got no time to hit the cafes like the. No <laughs> but but it was, um, it was seriously about that, though, you say that jokingly, but it must be a real concern with the whole uh, pandemic because, I mean, COVID is still around and there's all these other things, that, these other bugs that are, uh, that are happening. You, you must be, have to be careful about where you go, Daryl. Well, like, you know, like, particularly like races, there's no time to enjoy a brew, brew stop before the race um, because everybody's now in this bubble and we, you know, focused on that. But, you know, I mean, you also need to live. So, I mean, I do stop at the, you know, coffee shop, whatever. I prefer to sit outside if I have the choice. But, uh, you know, I think a lot of us have, well, myself, I, you know, I, I'm kind of just going, well, you know, I've had coronavirus, need to move on, but also need to be careful. But, um, you also get to a point where you just start going, well, you know what, like, let's just get on with it. Let's just move on with life. And like, geez, I mean, eventually you can hide as much as you want away from this thing, but uh, it's eventually going to get to you anyway. So, um, but like, you know, particularly now coming to the classics, these kinds of big races, you, you know, you don't want to risk it. So try and stay away um, as much as I can. But, you know, I mean, the kids are going to school. I mean, you're, you're, everybody's got a different dynamic, but I mean, it's if you're going to get it, you're going to get it somehow. Um, and yeah, I think I've just kind of moved on from it. Yeah. Did you dodge the sick bug? Because obviously, the last couple of races, you know, most of the teams are finishing with bloody two or three riders. Yeah, like, um, I dodged it, but uh, yeah, I mean, the guys in Torino kind of after Torino got sick, and I was thinking, oh, geez, my turn is coming, but I, I dodged that one. And then, uh, Catalonia, we lost another. Uh, we've lost four guys in Catalonia, so we finished with three. But it wasn't too bad because Lato Sudal actually finished with one. So actually, um, I was going to the start line then. I actually I took my camera with me and I was like, oh, <laughs> I get there and this is one Lotto guy. So I said, oh, you're waiting for your team. And he's like, man, I'm on my own here. <laughs> so I thought, oh, geez, it couldn't be so, you know, we were right. But um, yeah, I think the whole peloton kind of Paranese or the end of Torino got something. Um, I dodged it. But I remember doing Torino like two or three years ago with uh, with Green Edge. And it was only myself, Meza and Happy that walked, walked away unscathed as well during the same time. So uh, it's definitely something in the air, something going around here, but, you know, African. You know? Yeah, yeah. Oh, well, do you think also, <laughs> a, having kids, you know, they get so many bugs. Your immune system would probably... Exactly. Be I've had nine years of, the same. You I've had nine years control. of picking up all the bad ones. So, like, mm. I've probably already had them. Hey, we've got a live question for you, Daz. Uh, John wants to know, hey, Daryl, what are your thoughts and feelings about Benny's big win in Ghent Wavigan? Man, amazing. I mean, you know, like when people think about, when people don't realise like where everybody's, like particularly riders from Africa, uh, how far they've come and the, the obstacles they have to overcome just to get to Europe, you know, just a little thing like a visa. People think that's an easy thing. But for countries like Eritrea and that, it's, it's super difficult just to, get, just to get on to European land. Um, and then still to kind of, you know, they change their whole lifestyle, you know, you change you, everything. Like when I talk to Skabu from, from Ethiopia, like he tells me a story about like when he came to Europe, he never ate with a knife and fork before because they eat with their hands. So like mm. that's such a big culture change. And then you see him like walk into the biggest races of the world, um, you know, again, verbal game 
thing races that all the classics guys who do the classics talk about like oh you need to know this corner you need to need to know where you're going here but then this guy just comes and he answers with the legs you know he doesn't even need to he, he kind of probably gets sold okay being the front that's important but you know you still need to be able to learn that but here he comes just with the legs and just like just, yeah. just puts the guys amazing. away it's amazing like amazing. 20 i mean he's 21 years old too i mean he doesn't even he, you wouldn't even call him an experienced pro um it's fantastic for africa as a whole i think uh, you know we kind of always been seen as this as this continent where it's like uh, you know it's a poorer continent and things like that um but now you're seeing like everybody like that is coming from there that are racing europe they're overcoming all these obstacles and then they like it's kind of like the new Columbia of cycling, I think. It's kind of opened mm. up Pandora's box. And, uh, you know, I mean, I was super impressed. I was super chuffed for him too. I mean, I've, I don't know him at all, but just kind of, it felt like a win for Africa. It felt like so cool just to see someone win such a big race at such a high level and then just like, uh, I mean, put yeah, the man. best riders away. It's amazing. Yeah. It's a shame he's not uh, uh, riding Flanders because I think he would have gone really well. He was very good in Milan San Remo as well. So so he's obviously a huge talent. Oh, huge. I mean, but he, you know, you know what I really liked about him was when he won and they asked him this question, like, okay, do you want to do Flanders and like Shirley now? His headspace is like, he's like talking like a grown man. He's just kind of like, no, nah, you know, I've been away for a while. Now. I want to go home and see my family. So, you know, yeah, I'll have a turn at Flanders later down the road. But uh, he's not thinking, oh, my form's so good right now. I can, I should actually, you know, it was like, I was actually like, oh, this guy's actually got it right. You know, he's probably, yeah. he's probably got it right. His priorities are in line with what he wants to do. And he's, you know, and he's, he's won his race. And now he's kind of like, oh, I'll go box tick, go home, see the family and enjoy it with him. Well, I remember, yeah, we were talking about on the last episode when Dan Teklahominot was with the team. I, you're talking about those passport problems. I remember going on flights with him and being in Italy, and he would be whisked off and interrogated for like an hour and a half. And he said, this happens every time I travel, like just because of his passport. Mm -hmm. And it's all those things you don't see behind the scenes, as you're saying, Daryl. Like, um, yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's the insight that you don't know. Yeah. Uh, right. I think Eritrea even has like a thing with the government. Like you need to get special permission from the government to actually mm. get even a visa to come to Europe. So it's not just like, cool, I'll go to the Spanish embassy and get a visa. It's like, I think it's a bit more uh, in depth than what we actually yeah. know. Mm. Uh, we've got another comment. Sally says, great to see Daryl and Simon. I've really enjoyed Simon in commentary on SBS. So you've won Sally over Gero. That's a good start. <laughs> but you know, actually, when we... <laughs> When you asked me to come on the show, you said Gero was going to be on you. I thought, oh, now I know why you want me on you, because you need some colour, you know? You need some <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> it actually happened the other way. It actually happened the other way. I was talking with Dan. I said, well, Thursday's coming up. He's so busy these days, Dan, that you know, he doesn't even think about the detour that much. Well, and so I said, what's going on Thursday? He said, oh, I'll get on Daryl. I've been watching his show. It's fantastic. I'll get on to Daryl. And then about half an hour later, Simon – you rang me. You just got back from Europe. I hadn't answered all my calls while you're away, but you finally you got back to me, which is really good. And uh, I said, "Hey, we've got uh, Daryl on tomorrow. Do you want to join us?" So it happened the other way around, Daryl. Right, yeah. <laughs> Always calling you, Daryl. Always calling you. <laughs> Dude, like, you we, we obviously talk about it a lot. Um, the 2013 Tour de France, but I mean, you guys are going to be forever connected at the hip for that amazing gesture, you know, the transfer of the yellow jersey and at the time. But given that it was nine years ago almost now, uh, I'll ask you, Gero, like, how does it make you feel looking back now? Because at the time, people were going, oh, this, this will probably never happen again. In modern day cycling, I think that's almost guarantee. I can't, I can't really see that gesture happening again. Um, the way I look at like, I think at the time, it, we were just sort of taking the race in our stride. We were just so in the moment and so focused on the job at hand. And obviously, we're riding such a, a massive wave uh, at that point in time, getting the stage win down in Corsica and then, you know, the team's time trial victory with uh, with everybody as well. Um, and then sort of with off the back of that, getting the yellow jersey. So we were just riding a massive uh, high through that first sort of half of the Tour de France. Um, and it was only after the tour that I probably really sat down and reflected what we achieved in that Tour de France. Um, and that's when it probably all really sunk in, uh, the, the sort of the size of, of what we're able to sort of accomplish. And looking back at it now, obviously I'm immensely proud of 
of that point in my career and what Daryl and I uh, were both able to um, achieve in, in that tour. But it absolutely feels like a lifetime ago. I know you said, said it, was 10, it was nine years ago now, but um, after a couple of years out of the professional peloton, um, it just feels like it wasn't even me. It's sort of like it feels like it was something I watched on TV. And is that the same for you, Daryl? Yeah, like, you know, the, my teammates asked me a while ago, like, oh, geez, when when did you, what year were you in the Yellow Jews? And I'm like, oh, like, nine years ago, 2013. And they're like, geez, you've been pro for a long time. And it, <laughs> it, it, it actually is, you know, especially like the younger guys, like Charles Jones and that, they like kind of were like, oh, geez, where was I? Gee, I was in school, you know, like. Um, <laughs> so it, it, is, it is a long time ago. But, yeah, I mean, it's a... Uh, Definitely a memory that's going to be there forever. You know, it was the greatest achievement in my career. And it was um, just to, you know, the, with our whole team, with everybody to share, you know, the win on the team's time trial. That's like, there's like standout things in my career that like I look back and I go, this is like, you know, it's amazing to to feel that. And only when you get back to the Tour de France, I always say, whenever you go back there and you get the chance to race at that level again, and then you think, geez. We, I got on that stage then. I actually, well, you know, I, I wore the allergies. I won a stage or we went up there with the team's time trial. And you think, I don't know when I'll be back there. Like, you never know. And so that's what makes it so amazing when you get these these super highs. And then, you know, then you kind of get belted down pretty quickly at the Tour de France. But um, it's just, yeah, I think uh, when I look back at it, it, although it feels a lifetime ago, it's definitely like, Whenever I bring up those memories again, I get excited and I get that feeling of like <laughs> amazing, you know. I, I'm, I'm getting goosebumps while we're just talking about it because I got to tell you, that's the highlight of my career too. Because I, I was a bit crook you know, at that tour, but I got there. But and being a part of it with you guys, you know, traveling with you, and um, it was just enormous. And it was the early days of, of the first Australian team, only the second year, uh, really, for, for, for uh, Green Edge, Orica Green Edge, it was then. And now, when you look back, that was the most, that's been the best thing that ever happened for that team. I mean, they've won the Vuelta, almost won the Giro, and some great, some great classics, but that, especially that first week of that tour, is something, it was a Rocky type stuff. It was just amazing from the bus crashing into the, the first thing, then Gero, you winning on Corsica, the team time trial just staggering, and then the handover. It, it, those, all those things are, you know, just like a storybook, like a, like a little mini movie. And I, 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 they're just the, the most amazing uh, couple of weeks of my life, actually. They're just wonderful. But, uh, Gerard, do you find that the common thread with successful teams, and you look at that that period, is when there's chemistry, you know? When you get a group of guys that the chemistry is so tight, and even outside of, like, the riders, like the staff, like, everyone sort of bought into this culture of, you know, you took your job serious, but you also took having fun serious, and that enabled you not to sort of overstress at the biggest bike race in the world. Yeah, and I think that that was a really important element. We were we were great mates and we were having a good time uh, working really hard and, and racing our bikes. And I think we are just in that environment that it didn't matter who in the team we were supporting or was the, was the leader on that day, everyone was just more than happy to commit 100% to that. There was, there, was no, um, there was no egos in the team. It was all about, you know, that, just that team success. Um, and that's why I think, you know, on paper, when you look back at that Tour de France, we were far from the strongest team in the race, yet we managed to gel together to win the team's time trial. So it was a huge result. And then, you know, you're looking back on that tour, stage uh, two, I was leading at Daryl, and stage three, he turned around and, and led at me, you know, and that's just how we went about it. And so um, that was what was really unique about that team, and I think that's why the team of, of, of that Orica Green Edge team was so, was so successful. Well, the thing is, Daryl, if you look at your role as a videographer now, it, it does make a difference. As you said, when you take the air out of the room, you, you are slowly bringing in a bit of this sort of green edge culture with some of these guys at these tense races. Are you really going to up the ante for this when it comes to things like the Tour de France? 
Oof. Uh, oh, at the Tour de France, I don't know if I'll have the energy to uh, <laughs> do these videos. Um, it's, uh, yeah, and the Wi Fi is pretty, pretty shit there, too. To oh, don't get me started, mate. Oh, yeah. <laughs> You're understanding all the issues I had now. Uh, exactly. Like, as I've got into it, I've like understood these, these tops, and I'd see you come to the bus and go, man, I spent the whole night last night checking if the video was uploading. Not that I'm doing that, but I mean, <laughs> I, mean I, you, you, I can see, I can see all these things, but you know, I am. Um, Definitely, like, we, we had a bit of a rough patch at the start of the year in the team. And, uh, you know, I was, like, almost, like, I don't know what it was inside me, but I was just like, geez, we need to bring, like, some good, like, uh, you know, in Afrikaans, there's a chutzpah. Like, just bring some good spirits and good vibes to the team. And, like, then I started with these things, and I found a few characters. And then, actually, now the guys are watching it afterwards, they think it's pretty, like, fun to watch, you know. So, I, I think it was, like, with you when you started, like, only once guys started seeing themselves on the video and all these kinds of things, they started going, oh, that was pretty cool like, to, to see it, you know, and then if you get more people involved. But um, I, I just I just want to keep the, the vibe up, you know, and uh, it's been quite, uh, especially when we're not getting results and things, it's been quite difficult. So um, I'm trying to bring a little bit of what I learned at Green Edge into, into Israel and try and uh, see if we can change things around a bit. <laughs> A music video. You're going to do a music yeah. uh, video, uh, uh, a Dan Jones one, eh? I'm trying to do Instagram reels, mate. I'm not trying to do a video. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Tick, now, tick now, Gero, Daryl says his greatest achievement in his career or even at, at Greenwich was the yellow jersey. I think he's overshadowing a big one, and that was when he managed to coerx the team for those training camps in South Africa. I would say that that was he's up there with his greatest achievements. Would you agree? Uh, on on yeah for Daryl yeah for the rest yeah. of the team it's probably not so it's not spectacular it's getting uh, a completely different continent up on top of a mill yeah here in the middle of nowhere but uh, yeah Daryl's in his element that's for sure oh but they loved it eh? they got to see the animals we had a great we had a good time that was awesome <laughs> that was the video hit right yeah so, uptown I mean, funk exactly. we put Crystal Springs on the map. <laughs> But but no, the, the, the training camps in South Africa, Daryl, like, I mean, the weather, the, it's pretty cheap, um, you know, some great scenery. Are you, you, you going to get Israel to head up to Crystal Springs as well? Because I know Froomey, he used to get up there all the time. Uh, I think at one stage they were contemplating it, but to be honest, our calendar is so busy on this team. Like, we do a lot of races, a lot of smaller races, so we actually don't have a gap. Like uh, we did with Greenwich. Greenwich kind of we used to have like that February month was pretty mm. low key, and then uh, you know we'd finish down under and, that, and then go across there. But now with uh, with all the racing here at Israel, there's there's actually no space in the calendar to chuck a full team into into South Africa. Maybe we could get a small group, but uh, you know with all this pandemic and all this other nonsense that's been going around, it's been super hard just to do a training camp even in Europe. So. Um, no one wants to get stuck in South Africa. I can promise you that much. <laughs> yeah. I've got, I've got to ask you, uh, Adele, um, what, what's the, the vibe like at, at Israel Premier Tech, as it is at the moment? At, at the moment, because, I mean, it's just second year into the, into the World Tour. Uh, the results haven't come through as you, you would have hoped, um, and you're under a bit of pressure. So uh, what's the vibe like in the team? Look, I mean, last last year the team actually didn't do too badly. We were still hit by quite a few injuries, but a, you know, a few crashes and things like that of quite a, of some of the key guys. So, we, relatively last year, we I think we finished ninth or so in the in the World Tour rankings that year. So we actually punched quite well above our weights, I'd say. Um, this year, obviously, we we paying the price for you know when the team bought the license um, as a World Tour team the first year, and they were still kind of what you'd say, they were pro-conti level. They didn't really have a lot of World Tour experience uh, riders in the team. And the first year, they struggled to get points. So now in the third year, when you actually, you you know, to 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 stay in the World Tour now, we've got three, that's the three years of points added up together. Um, so we really missed already one year. Um, and we kind of were hoping to pick up that slack this year. And then we've had a bit of a bad start to the year, which has created a bit of... Uh, uh, a little bit of concern within the team, you know, just about points and things like that. And, uh, you know, there's a few more teams now interested in making it into the World Tour. Um, so, of course, we know we, we need to get results and we need to get the points. Um, but, you know, it's I think a lot of guys we've had to kind of reset a little bit. And we had a big chat the other day with the team just to kind of 
calm everyone down again and just say, listen, guys, bike racing comes first, wins and that. They bring points on their own. So let's not focus on the points. Let's focus on actually going to the race to try and win the bike races. Yeah. Um, so I think that's where we're at really at the moment is we, we, I think we were trying to chase a lot of points and that's been on our, our sole focus. And then we've kind of missed the, just the really good part about racing a bike and going for, going for it. Um, but I think as a team, we look, it's a different vibe compared to Green Edge because Green Edge was more, I mean, they're both English speaking teams, but you had this real Aussie culture in, in Green Edge that was there from the start. Uh, that's also changed over the years. That's also once the team started becoming more GC orientated, it did change a bit. But there were still the core guys there. Whereas Israel is such a new team, and kind of we've got guys from all over the show. It's not really like one set identity. Mm. Um, that's been quite difficult, quite a challenge because like some things I think is funny, and other guys are like, "What's he? What's he up to? This guy's a bit weird," you know. Whereas <laughs> Green Edge was like almost the thing, you know. It was like. <laughs> And you, right, you had right, right, Belgium. Right. Yeah. So like you had like the Belgium, so say you had like Kukale and these guys, like guys from Belgium, yeah. they were just a bit of different humor. And then eventually it wasn't like they just had to fit in, you know. Whereas yeah, it's yeah. kind of like everyone's trying to know what, what we're fitting into because we still don't have that like niche culture yet. But I, I think we're getting there. I think we're getting there. Well, there is a Garen's connection to your team, and that is uh Andrew Garen's came over to join the crew uh for this season. As he so slotted in, parents. we got the better one. Ooh, <laughs> geez, shots fired! Whack, whack! Shots I was fired! Why you so few people finishing the races? He's running <laughs> <laughs> uh, Ooh, yeah. whack, whack! Yeah, so. whack, whack. Oh, shame, Andy! Don't try to defend himself, eh? <laughs> yeah. Well, you, you have got a bit of an Aussie connection. I mean, you've got uh, young Seb, Seb Berwick, uh, young Taz Ta- 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 yeah. Ta- Ta- Jones, and, of course, Simon Clark, who came over, got in at the last minute, has been going great guns. Uh, yeah. So a bit, bit of an Aussie feel there, mate. Yeah, like, you know, we, we've actually, the team this year, is the, we've got, we, like, when we went to training camp at the start of year, we had great vibe. Like, I think everybody's, I think it, if it wasn't this points debacle, we'd be all, all, all okay, you know. Um, I think it, just a bit of stress from, from the rider side, really, you know, kind of just wanting to get into that zone of like, you know, we don't want to be in that team that's on the cusp of getting relegated. Um, but yeah, I think we, we got we got a heap of, uh, you know, it's actually quite weird because when you change teams, you think like you always have this perception of other riders on other teams and you've just seen them at the food hall and at breakfast or something, you know, he's a bit of a weird guy or whatever. But then actually when you get to, when you're in the team and you meet these guys, you just realize like, well, he, you know, He's a little bit different, not the same, but there's something else I like about him. There's actually, he's got yeah. good, you know, and you realize that most of the guys in the pro pillars are actually, you know, all decent, decent people, you know, not everybody, of course, but I mean, you realize that actually in every team, it's pretty much run the same. There might be a few things that are run differently. You know, some teams put more emphasis on structure. Some teams put more emphasis on family time, but, you know, ultimately the way a team is run is pretty much the same thing. You just got to find your, where you fit into the new team, you know, and uh, who you have to impress. And yeah, that was quite different for me. Is that kind of, I was a clean slate and it was more like, I've got to like impress everybody again, which was quite cool. Mm. I, I would have been a terrible cyclist because if I was on a good contract, and I was we on know the team, that. I, yeah, I know. And I'll put my hand up. But my mentality just would have been rotten because if I was on a team that looked like they were going to get relegated, come June, I'd be saying to me, manager, mate, let's go find one of the big boys. And just take a bit of a slice, get back yeah. to the tour. Jonesy leads out the sprints. I'll be fine. Now, the, sprint the, other, the other thing, of course, is uh, the biggest name on your team, Chris Froome. Um, how's he going? I mean, it's been it's, – it's something we're all riveted on, interested in. He's been such a superstar, and the challenges he's had have been quite horrendous. And so how is he going right now? Um, I think he, uh, look. I think he's uh, he's still kind of he's still really climbing the the way up to top form. Um, he went to he, you know started the year with, with a bit of an injury, and then um, he's only done copy partially, so he hasn't done much racing at all. So I mean, it was his first race. He, he said he struggled a bit through it. Um, I think he's been quite amazed about how much the levels picked up in the last two or three years. You know, kind of. He's also had the armchair ride of, uh, of Sky and Ineos where he used to just sit in the front all day and not have to do a sprint out of every corner. 
And, you know, changing teams to a team like Israel or any other team for that matter is, you know, is that, you know, we were fighting for position behind. And I don't think he was used to that fight for position last year. You know, that was a big, big change for him. But, uh, you know, mentally, he's he, he wants to take it head on. Mentally, he's still training hard, still working hard, still still focused on trying to, you know, get back to his best. Um, but, yeah, I, I think by his own admission, he, he knows he's nowhere where he should be. Um, at this point, but um, I don't think it's from lack of trying. I think it's just, you know, it's just a really, it's just a slow, hard process and it's just a long process for him. But uh, yeah, I'm hoping for him that it, uh, things can turn around and, you know, maybe it's just a confidence thing that like he needs to do one or two races where he feels good again and he's actually at that level. And maybe that's the thing that will change things, but it must be super difficult for a guy who's been at his level um, you know, you go to race like Copy Bartley compared to the Tour de France. I mean, and you're saying that's hard. It's, it's, that's, you know, already you can, you can sense like it's, it must be hard for him to deal with that. I'm, I'm sure it can't be easy for any of these top, top guys to have a, such a massive injury and then, then still like want to come back and compete at that level that you were previously at. It must be super hard. I mean, yeah, yeah, if you're one or two percent off now in the races, you, you dropped. You're not in the, you're not like, you might not even make Gruppetto. You know, that's how competitive it is these days. Mm. What What was amazing is uh, on the cycling tip show, they do Venga with Matty Keenan and uh, Nettie Edmondson and Mitch Docker. They talked about Froomey. And uh, Mitch was saying, oh, you know, I'm worried about his legacy. And, you know, Ash Barty's just retired on top of a game. Should Froomey look at retirement and all this sort of stuff? And he actually commented on the video. And he said, if I had that mentality, I never would have won a Tour de France. I don't just walk away from challenges. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I'm going to stick with it and I'm just going to give it everything I've got. And I thought, geez, chapeau, like that's such a good insight because some people are wired differently. Like some people, if it did get hard, they just go. Pfft. And again, if I was a cyclist, I would have probably walked away because I don't have the mental toughness, but yeah. everyone's, everyone's made a different stuff. And I think, you know, good on him for hanging in there and having a crack and he may never get back to that top level, but he's, he's going to find out, you know? You know, like yeah, of, oh, sorry, sorry, mate. Go, go down. I mean, like, you know, even a lot of people when we were racing 2008, 2009 in Bollywood, we they were like, who's this? Like, you know, then he was still Kenyan. And they were like, I got a photo of that, I think. Here yeah, who's, who's this Kenyan? You know, like, he knows nothing about cycling. Like, he was all like inexperienced. And, you know, no, nobody would have thought back then, like, oh, Chris Room's going to go and win the Twitter France four times or win the Volta and become mm. this, like, you know, world's best cyclist. So, um, and he believed in himself then. You know, he at that point was like, I'll show you guys, I'll show you guys. So maybe this is one of these moments again where he's just like, Yeah, you know, everyone's laughing at me now, but you know, I, I'm, I'm just going to carry on doing what I need to do. And when I get back there, then I'll, you know, all the data I'll show them. Um, if there's one guy who can do it, it's him. Uh, the, like I say, the mental toughness of this guy above anybody else, I, yeah, yeah, I haven't really seen it uh, from other athletes, you know. Yeah. But- but Gary, that, you, was, you that had, was the question well, I was going to ask, Gary, because exactly yeah. that mental toughness. Yeah. You started out coming into cycling through a terrible injury from a motorbike crash, and even when you actually got the stage of making it to Europe, and you did the hard, hardest possible way, you didn't get through, you know, the Australian Institute and all that. You were over there racing for amateur type teams, semi pro teams, and all around the place, Norway, whatever. Even when you were racing in the Grand Tours, you still had some. Uh, injuries to overcome from that original uh, accident. So I, I can't think of anyone better to comment on uh, 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 Froomey's situation than you. Well, as far as com- overcoming injuries, yeah, but I think <clears throat> what's really hard for Froomey is he said he's set such a high level and he's always going to be compared to that. No matter, you know, if he came back and was racing at a higher level than he's ever raced before, but he doesn't win, he's always going to be compared to that that winning that winning um, level. Which is which is would be extremely tough for him. It was I was coming from a very different scenario, coming through the ranks and always carrying injuries and sort of having chronic sort of problems from the motorbike crashing. Because while I was improving, everything was a bonus, and and every race you turn up to and you do a better result than last time, you perform a higher level. Um, everyone's really happy. Once you kind of hit that peak and you start to come down again, and you're getting compared to your your former level, it does become really mentally taxing. So. I think as long as Froomey still has the ability just to drown out all that noise and focus on what he's doing um, and chase his goals, I think he'll be fine. And, you know, I expect to see him around and in the peloton for a number of years yet. Do you think, Gero, that there's 
something in the sort of 1% to 2% that you can't actually put a finger on because a lot of riders, they train, they do a lot of things the right way or whatever. But what is it that separates the top guys from the guys that are still doing all the same things? Is, does it all come down to that sort of mental approach? Oh, yeah, well, a mental approach is obviously, is obviously a, a massive part of it. But, um, yeah, the physiology is a big, big part of it too. I think even more so these days than ever before. And it feels like racing has become less tactical and more physiological um, than it's ever been. So the mental toughness and the ability to suffer and, and keep fronting up day in, day out um, is, is one of the most vital vital parts of it. And, and just it's just that consistency that really counts. It's, you always come across guys, and I think, you know, Daryl Bash this as well, over the course of a career and you go, this guy's an incredibly talented cyclist, but they only have the ability to focus for a short amount of time. Whereas the champions, they can focus day in, day out for season upon season. And that's why they race at a high level for so long. Mm. All right. We're going to take a quick break. When we come back, more of Imps and Garo on the detour. Look at this bike. You think it's just a bike, right? But it's not. <clears throat> it's a bike. 374 people are looking at. This guy, this girl, them all looking at it. People from here, there, and wherever this is. People that are looking for a bike. Or just a piece of it. Amateurs, semi-amateurs, and pro-amateurs. This guy wants this bike, but with this crank and these bars. This could be the perfect match, but not this one. This girl has a bike to sell, and thousands of people might purchase it. Eyes on Bikes help grow small businesses. His, hers, yours, and the latest data and insights help those businesses keep moving. We are the world's number one bike marketplace with over 500,000 products and 900 brands where buyers and sellers are brought together in a place where a bike is never just a bike. Bike Exchange, where the world buys, sells, learns, and rides. Are you dreaming of the ultimate cycling holiday? Mumu Cycling is the best in the business. Official tour operators for all Grand Tours and Monuments, you will ride the best climbs. Enjoy VIP access and race viewing all hosted by some of the world's best pros, including 17-time Tour de France rider and Paris-Roubaix champion Stuart O'Grady. Start planning your ultimate holiday at www.mamoucycling.com. Thanks again to Bike Exchange and Moomoo Cycling. Iffy, how are we going with the tickets for Moomoo? Yeah, Moomoo are going well. They're over there at the moment, of course, with the uh, um, with Stewie and the gang uh, mm. at the at the Classics. So they'll be all having a ball. Uh, evidently, a couple of spots still for the last week of the Giro and uh, still some spots for the Tour de France. So jump on to moomoocycling.com and, uh, and check it out. Now, just a random uh, photo. I was trying to look for a classic snap of Daryl, and one of my favourites is when you won the Tour of Alberta, Dazzler, and they mm. gave you that uh, cowboy hat. But I actually found that this photo, if you get on Wikipedia and you type in Podium Girls, this is it. This is the photo that represents it. So that's a bloody feather in your think cap, mate. Think of, think of the past. <laughs> yeah, that's it, you know. Ah, oh, the good old days. The good old days. <laughs> That's it. That's it. Now, uh, we've obviously got, you know, Tour of Flanders coming up. Gero, you would have done mountains of research for your commentary on the weekend. And a few people that like a bit of a dabble on the punt, watch this show. Who's your red hot tip for Flanders on the weekend? Yeah, I start my research on Saturday, mate. <laughs> oh, smart. <laughs> I've, been, uh, I've, been, I've been researching for 20 years and I just fine tuned it all the day before. Um, That's it. But it's, uh, it's coming up, it's shaping up to be a really exciting Flanders. And I think there's so many um, contenders that are really coming into form at an opportune, opportune time. The fact that uh, Matthew Van Der Poel had a win yesterday, um, it's only second race day on the road for, for this season behind Milan San Remo where he was on the podium. So he, seemed, he looks like he's got it just right. 
obviously Walt Van Aert has just uh, has dominated so far this year, not only individually but with his team as well. So I think on paper he's going to have the, the strongest team in the race. And the fact that uh, Quick Step Alpha Vinyl have been getting a, a bit of a belting by their standards um, in the in the Flemish races so far this year, I think they're going to really come come out with a point to prove too. Now, Darrell, I remember when you rode your first Flanders and the conversation Matty Wilson had with you, I think, early in the year, he goes, mate, you are primed to ride Flanders. And you're like, I don't want to ride Flanders. And then he talked you into it. And then you got yourself into the brake and you had the helmet, the what was it, the flat helmet with the cap on underneath. Yeah, and you, yeah. you changed cycling uh, fashion forever after that. <laughs> well, it was, well it, it was meant to rain. So, like, I thought I'll wear the cap underneath my helmet. And then it never rained. And then I got in the breakaway and it was like just, you know, the peak was just like covering my vision. <laughs> so then I thought, I'll just flip it up. And then, you know, I mean, with the aero helmet, so you're wearing an aero helmet and then with the cap <laughs> flipped up. It's not, it's not the best combination. <laughs> but you know what, I'll tell you what I did. I only did Flanders that year because that guy sitting there, Simon Gerrans, he was supposed to do it. And we were supposed to go on as this team, like, and I was going there to support him. And then he pulled <laughs> up of Flanders. And also oh. I did recon and all these things. And it was like we, Simon is actually going to have a target of doing those races, and then all of a sudden he said, "No, mate, I'm uh, preparing for the other classics now." So then I was like, "Oh well, no, I'm, I don't have the luxury to say to the team, listen, guys, I'm just gonna well, think of that." I, I, I remember that exactly, Daryl. Um, we've it was the start of the 2014 season. Whitey's come up with his harebrained scheme. It's like I think you should be focusing on on the Flemish classics and do Flanders. So we. Arrived. We'd done the Australian summer races, which went uh, really well. We turned up in Europe, and after being in Europe for about a week, they organised the Flanders Recon. So a group of us flew up there. It was sort of generally the Flanders team. I think it was myself, and I'm not sure if you were there as well, Daryl, but we basically went and rode a Tour of Flanders Recon, and it was about two degrees and raining sideways. And I've got around this recon, I think still with jet lag. I was a little bit sick, and I got to the end of it, and I've said to Lepage, this is not a race for me, mate. I'm out, and I basically parachuted out at that point in time, uh, a month or two before before the Flemish Classics even started. <laughs> so you would have been pissed off when Gary won Liège that year because you're like, bah, it, it was right. <laughs> well, I was there for Liège, so I was happy to be there. I oh like, yeah, <laughs> all was well. Did the a great job. One. Did a, did a was, big job I too. Did I all of these big wins, so that was cool. I mean, that was, uh, <laughs> yeah. And, well, but, you, but you know, the Flanders that year, I, I remember when I, they teams to me, no, we're saving you, you know, whatever. And when I got the chance to get in that breakaway, I did because I thought, I'm in the safest place of the race right now. Well, if I'm here, and it was a great breakaway. I mean, we had a good good group. But all I could think about when I was in that front group was how safe I actually am compared to <laughs> the guys back there. Like, yeah. I'm happy to be here. Yeah. But, but I, rem- I remember the footage that blew me away was the sign-on. I think that was when we put some some cameras on the helmets or whatever, but that absolutely floored me in terms of, you know, that is their Super Bowl in Belgium. Mm-hmm. And just the atmosphere that you get pre-start, is that unlike any race in the world, Ims? Yeah, like, you know, you get it at the Tour de France as well, but definitely the, um, you know, Flanders is the... Is huge. I mean, you're in that in that square there, and all those kinds of things. But it's it's uh, definitely when you, the thing with the big classics is that you feel that hype. You know, you feel that like, oh, this is a massive day. This is this is you know, you're going there to the sign in, and you kind of like you you feel like all the people around you, and a couple of people might shout your name or whatever. But then you get on the stage, and you're like, wow, this is this is it. You know, this is the big day. Like yeah. this is. This is the moment. And, uh, but yeah, I, you know, but could you imagine riding in, winning the race and you like, you know, you've oh. got the day. that must be even better. And you come back the next year and then you, you come as a previous winner. That must be special. Mm. Yeah. We've got a uh, couple, couple more comments. Uh, so Simon, I mean, yeah, it, Simon Knowles, Knowlesy, he says, was wondering, Gero still has contact with Aussie cycling icon Phil Anderson. Phil was my childhood idol. Yeah, I still run into Phil every now and then. We don't keep in sort of regular contact, but we've did it, we've done a couple of rides together over the past uh, eighteen months or so since I've been back in Australia, and he's fit as ever. And I and I think I'd probably safely say there's not too many people around that would have ridden more kilometres than, than Phil Anderson over the past sixty odd years. Oh, loves it. 
Um, we've Be- got beaten, one. In a, beaten a photo finish twice in, uh, in, in Tour of Flanders. So there you go. So uh, wants to know, will Cal O'Brien and Grace Brown make it an Aussie double win at Flanders, Iffy? Yeah. Well, I'll tell you what, Cal O'Brien was impressive uh, 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 yesterday uh, in Dwarves of Blunder. And he, he, in the break all day, they get caught. He stayed with the big moves in the last part and finished, I think, finished seventh. Very, very impressive ride. Uh, now, we've got another one from regular Tom Maloney. He says, I'm happy to be able to watch you guys as I crashed a gravel race last Saturday on a bush track near Layla. Broke left leg near hip in Ballarat, uh, but he's on the mend with a metal rod in his leg. So oh, he- heal up, Tom. Uh, and then we- we've had a lot of comments uh, f- about uh, Richard Moore. Brendan Marshall says, if he laid again, I think that was at the start of the show. Vale, fellow podcast legend, the Buffalo Richard Moore. Uh, and then Ben Jensen says, was nice to bump into John about a week ago. Hope the cycling trip went well. Yes, well, it did. <laughs> yeah, we were. Uh, yeah, we had them three days up at the Gamby with the with the the uh, Green Edge Senior Team, as we call it. Like Dad's Army, partly buddies. Dad's Army. Uh, we had a ball. Actually. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah. yeah. Now, uh, Ims, what's your schedule looking like for the rest of the season, mate? Well, um, I'm going to Amstel. That's the next race uh, next Sunday, and then do Brabant's Pale, and then after that, I'll be doing Flesh and then Liège, and then having a small break. And then it's going to be like, um, you know, it should be in the Tour de France, but we don't know. Uh, you know, I think at the start of the year, the team was kind of like, we'll see where you're at after your injury. And, you know, I don't know if I've done enough to kind of cement my spot and probably not yet. Um, so kind of need to build up now to, you know, Dauphiné and things like that. But, yeah, just keep working hard, man. Just keep working hard and hopefully do the Tour de France. And then, um, and then we'll see after that, whatever legs we've got. For the rest of the season will be determined. Well, how- who, who, who is your main guy for the Tour de France? I mean, Woodsy, if he's in form, is capable of getting on the podium. So is he getting back to that sort of form? Because he had a couple of little challenges earlier this year too. Yeah, I think, you know, he got coronavirus earlier in the season and things like that. So he's a little bit behind where he wanted to be. But um, I think I think Woodsy would definitely going, be definitely going to the Tour. I don't know if it's fully to ride GC. I think he'd be going there for um, target stage wins. You know, the GC now is so... It's so difficult to um, to be up there now with with the likes of Pogica and, and people like that. They can time trial really well. Um, you know, the time trial is really Woods is Achilles heel. Um, you know, he can climb with the best, but it, it does hamper you know hamper him a bit. But then also, like I think over the years we've kind of I think a lot of teams have kind of come to this resolu- like this realization that like you know what's fifth or eighth in the Tour de France in general classification, which is great for the rider, right? Don't get me wrong. Top 10 in the Tour de France is massive. But then he's a stage win better than that for the team and then also yeah, yeah, for yeah, the rider. Yeah. And, and can, Woodsy, can can a guy like him win one or two stages in the mountains? Yes, he can. Um, is he one of the favorites to do that? Yes, he can. You know, So tactically, it might be a good, better option to actually make him lose time and let him have the freedom to go in those long breakaways and go for a stage win. Um, you know, Israel's never won a stage in the Tour de France, so um, I think that'd be fantastic. But I don't think we have one clear leader in the team at the moment. We've still got to see how Fools, Fools Lung goes, and, you know, we've got a few new guys in the team. And then also the combination of, you know, you, you, can can everybody work together as a team or we have a great team that will be successful together? And it's like we spoke about earlier, it's about getting that culture together that, you know, we might have all the names in the team and we might have Chris Freeman, we might have this guy and that guy, but ultimately we want to get to the Tour de France, I think, with a team that's got one ambition and, and a clear and a clear goal. So um, hopefully I fit into those plans and then I think we'll we'll see how we go. But uh, definitely it's still a load of racing coming up and, yeah. uh, you know, lots of people still, there's lots of things that can change during the year. Yeah. Um, Gerard, do you think that there's like, Ims mentioned it a bit earlier with the points situation and potential, you know, relegation if you're in the bottom end. But do you think the back end of the season is going to be a mad scramble for a lot of these teams going, holy shit, we need to get some points or, or that's it, we're, we're in Barney Rubble? Uh, to be totally honest with you, Dan, I don't know how the new point system works. Um, but, you know, there, there is always a scramble. And I think there's a, just like a pressure cooker that builds throughout the year for the team that, that, are, ch- that are chasing points. Um, and the ones that get it right, tend not to focus too much on the points. They focus on the process and pre- preparing as best they can for the races. And then, like I think Daryl said a bit earlier as well, the results take care of themselves. 
if you get everything right in the lead up to the race, you you really don't have any control over the form of your your rivals. So if you just focus on you know doing the best preparation you can and, and being the best you can be, then you know these guys are all champions and they'll come up in a good form. Well, I think I read an article at the start of the year. There was about six teams that were sort of all around the mark um, that were in the sort of bottom echelon. I think it's the top eighteen, isn't it? Iffy that that get yeah. through to the world tour and then the bottom. Yeah, I think it was five or six. We're sort of around the mark, but four. yeah, yeah. Oh, it's a fluff question, let's be honest. Well, you know, it used to, well, it used to also be like back in the day, like, I mean, a few years ago, you could actually buy riders with points. So actually, the riders held the value. So yeah. if the rider had that 800 points, 1,000 points, basically a team could be close to relegation and a team would just go, okay, I want so-and-so, bang, and that's buy it. And they would have enough points to carry them through. Whereas now that's all changed. It's actually, you need to be on that team to earn those points. Yes. So, mm. so if, you, if you're in... Yeah, so like anyone, you can't buy like Alejandro Valverde next year and just say, oh, cool, I'll buy him for his points. You know, it just mm. won't happen. So, mm. uh, now, Will Wizard, he's trying to poke the bear. He goes, ask the hard questions. Dan, ask Daryl about his crash with Rob Stannard. No, oh, that's a great question. Thanks for that yeah. one. Good yeah. on, Will Wizard. <laughs> But no, it was a, it was a serious crash. Uh, we uh, we haven't caught up with you on the potty since then. But um, yeah, yeah um, look, look, look. I, I'll say it outright. That then I'll say the part to play. Now I'm not taking that I didn't have responsibility in the crash. Um, you know, for sure I deviated off my line slightly. Um, you know, I think it was just a combination of things going. You know, two things going wrong at the at the same time. I, I deviated. Rob had his head down. There was space to pass, but you know the. You know, ultimately, I paid the big price for it. Um, you know, with a broken, broken hip and a, and a broken collarbone, so and losing out on the tour and everything else. So, sure, I, I, uh, you know, I also take responsibility for it. And uh, you know, that's that's all I really have to say about it. It was, uh, it was a tough crash, and yeah, that's, and, yeah, that's, that's bikes, as they say in the classics. Mm. That you know, that, sometimes, also, sometimes it's also when you're in that moment of sprinting. I mean, I'd Ethan on my right, and we were, you know, you're going for it, and sometimes you just do gravitate a little bit to one side. You, you know, if, mm. if you hear something coming, you just kind of, you know, I, I don't know how to explain it, but yeah. it's it wasn't a malicious or anything on purpose, but you know, it's, uh, you're too nice a bloke, Daz. We well, it's not in your nature. I tell you what, I didn't appreciate over the finish line that I didn't appreciate, but anyway, well, that's another topic. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I've never broken a bone in my body, mate. I think, you know, breaking a hip as a cyclist is, is one, right up there in the, the sort of serious category. How was the recovery from that? Like, how well, long were you literally off the bike and not, you couldn't do anything? Well, uh, yeah, I was off the bike for, oof, I think it was about six or eight weeks. And I was in a wheelchair to start because basically because I had broken the collarbone. And obviously the pelvis, then I couldn't, I couldn't crutch. So I had to be in the wheelchairs just to get around, you know, showering, showering the chair in the shower and all these kinds of things. So, um, yeah, I, that was tough, you know, kind of had to learn to kind of walk again and things like that afterwards, after being able to crutch. And so it was a long process. Um, I did get back to racing at the end of the season, but it was, you know, it was more about just getting back for myself mentally just to go, okay, I actually did something. I accomplished something. I had a goal just to race at the end of the year, just to kind of pin a number on and get like, okay, I, I know where I need to work from, but um, yeah, it was a, you know, still even coming into the start of the season, I was really like shaken up, you know, first race in, in France. Mm -hmm. It was just like a few sketchy roads and things like that. And I, I wasn't ready for it yet, but now that I've been racing comfortably for a while, um, getting back into the swing of things, but even in Catalonia, there was a few opportunities in this, in the, you know, in this finals, and I just missed something. Like I, I was kind of hesitating, kind of breaking too soon. Um, so I think it's still taking time just to get myself in that, like myself in that death zone. But yeah, it's uh, it's part of bike racing, you know. It's not it's not something I'm not used to. I've had a few setbacks, few broken bones before, so definitely it was the hardest one and the longest one but uh, you know it's also come at a time in my career where it's you know i'm not uh, 25 anymore so it well, mm. wasn't as easy to recover from yeah sure mm. all right if you anything you want to wrap things up with johnny well uh, just uh, patty bevan uh how, how's he going I, i'm a big fan of patty bevan he's one of the toughest nuts um and um yeah a, a great bike rider. well how's his form at the moment 
Well, I'm not too sure. He hasn't raced uh, for a while because he broke. His, I think he broke his hand or his wrist at the start of the year. So um, yeah. I don't think he's been on the, been at the races yet. And he lives in Andorra, so I haven't actually had a chance to actually see him um, on the road at all. But uh, you know, he's got great potential for sure. He'll be back. He'll probably come and do the Giro, or that'll probably like Romandy Giro or something like that. But um, he will be back soon, I'm sure. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Anything uh, for Simon, Jonathan? Gero, um, yes, now that you're back in the real world, it's just that uh, I'm going to look forward to you comment, uh, commentating at the Giro. So I'm going to be over at the Giro and uh, I've been uh, talking to Catherine. So I'm going to be travelling with the team. So um, any questions you have for any of the guys on the team, I'm the man. Just give me a, a text and I'll uh, get all the, all the inside info for you, mate. Appreciate that, Ify. Thank you. <laughs> and the Will Wizard, uh, he says, thanks, Dan and Daryl. Didn't realise you broke your hip. Good luck for the rest of the season. So good on your wheel, Wizard. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, no, it's been an absolute pleasure having you guys on the show. It's always great to catch up again. And make sure, if you're watching uh, Daryl Impey YouTube, you got to check it out yes. because he's got plenty of zingers playing for the rest of the year. Great insights to the team. And, uh, yeah, geez, I think who's, we're doing who's, a uh, who's leading the subscriber race here, guys? Oh, I mean, Daryl's smashing us. Oh, we, oh, I don't know. We, we don't check that stuff, Daryl. Well, it's about the views. numbers. Well, like, I'm yeah. learning different things. Is it, is it about like unique viewers or viewers or, like, or returning viewers? It's like all these things. Like, yeah. Are you sure you haven't <laughs> delegated to a guy to boost the posts? So, you know, those sort of fake views that you get to sort of bump the no, numbers? No, but I heard it doesn't do well for you. You can right? buy, you can buy it. Do. Twitter followers. <laughs> it doesn't help the algorithm. You know? That's right. That's right. Well, all these things, I've got to, yeah, it's a whole different right. world of stuff. That's right. I heard with the, with the podcast, with the with the YouTube, with all the different things, I heard we're up around 4,000, but who would know? Who That's would it. Well, yeah. uh, now, watching. Tom says, thanks for the recovery inspiration, Daryl. I'm not 25 either, but I'll set myself a six weeks marker. So there you go. Now, I wanted to wish uh, Tommy Maloney all, all the best. I raced over in Europe with Tommy. He was a, a legend, actually, a very, very tough bike rider. Probably the best bike rider not to get picked to go away in the game back in, in my day because he was on the verge always. A couple of years older than me, travelled around Europe with me as an amateur. A sensational bloke. So, Tommy, uh, get well soon, bud. And before we let you go, guys, Gero, uh, service course, if people wanted to travel over, we're obviously talking about Moo Moo Cycling for the races, but if they want to come over to Girona and, you know, have a spin with uh, some big names and uh, get amongst it, what do they got to do? Yeah, jump on the service course website, uh, which is the servicecourse.cc. We have um, trips on Daryl's home roads in, uh, in Girona. We have a location in Nice now, so we do some rides around um, the Nice area and Oslo and up in the Peaks District as well. And we also, so a couple of different places to come and ride your bike with us. Uh, perfect, mate. We'll check out the yeah. uh, Service Course website. Thanks for joining us, guys, and also to get our organic uh, subscribers up, youtube.com forward slash the Detour Podcast. We don't pay for them here, mate. But uh, <laughs> no, it's been bloody great having you guys on the show. All the best for the rest of the season, Daryl, and look forward to your commentary on the weekend, yeah, Gero. And go, and go Grace Brown in, in Flanders. I didn't answer that one before. She, she, I think she'll uh, um, give it a bit of a shake. All right. Yeah. Well, we'll be back again early next week. I think we've got Scotty Sutherland, don't we, Ify? Yes, we've got him on Monday to do a, a, a wrap of, uh, of Flanders. And, uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to it. It should be an absolutely amazing race. It always is. But uh, I think it's shaping up to be a ripper. All right. Thanks for tuning in, guys. We'll see you soon. Thanks, Daz. Well, thanks. thanks, Sims. See Cheers, you, guys. Thanks, guys. Thanks, guys. Thanks, guys. Great to see you, Daryl. Bye. This is the winning ride of the Tour de France.